Uh, we're on the subject of loving God. Can everybody say with me, loving God? To love God is your purpose in this world. You were created by God for God. You were created by God for God. Your existence is no um, existence of chance or a by the way existence. You were not created by the way, but you were created by design. There's a blueprint. God know who you are. Wonderfully, fearfully, He created you in His image and in His likeness. Isn't that powerful? And so when Jesus was asked about, you know, the commandments, and you've got to understand that the Jewish people had many commandments, many rules, many laws, Jesus directed them to the great commandment, or what we know as the great commandment. He said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, you must love the Lord your God with, say with me, all, all, all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Listen, church. Jesus is either Lord of all or is not Lord at all. There's no such thing as compartmentalizing Christianity. You can't be a Sunday Christian. In other words, oh, you know, now it's Sunday and I put on my, my worship jacket. My, I clothe myself now with holiness and I'm going to church now. And, you know, this is now my religion department. And when I get out of church, you know, then I enter into a different aspect of my life. Tomorrow when I go to work, I, that's a different aspect. When I go to school, you know, that's a different part. No, God wants to be God of all. Say with me. Jesus said, I want you, this is the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with. Say with me, all in all. <laughs> All in all. <laughs> Are you with me? So God is either God of everything, all, or He's not God at all. And these are the words of Hudson Taylor, uh, actually a, a, a missionary to China. He, he used to say, Lord, the Lord God is either the Lord of all or is not Lord at all in your life. You cannot have a Sunday department, a Monday department. You cannot compartmentalize God. He's not just God of a certain area of your life. And that's why we, got to have, we need to talk about l loving God through a lifestyle of worship. Every area, every aspect of our lives needs to be submitted to God. So that's the great commandment. What's the great commandment? So in other words, what's your purpose in life is to? Your purpose in life is not your job. Your purpose in life is not your children. Your purpose in life is not your career. It's not, it's not your purpose. What's your purpose? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, everything that, that you are. And obviously from that, what do we do? We start to do the will of God. And yes, from there, we, we live our lives. But what we do, everything that we do, we do unto the Lord. Everything we do is for God and because of God and because we love God and because there's a plan and a purpose of God within our, with, uh, you know, within our lives. So many people are worshiping different areas and parts of their lives, but they're not worshiping God. They, God is not God of all. God is, if God cannot be God of all, He, he, he will not be God at all within our lives. So you must love the Lord. And, you know, this is how Jesus said it. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart. And he says then, uh, secondly, as equally important that you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. So when we talk about worship, will you agree that we will have to get to the place where we talk about loving people and having compassion for people? Amen. Um, so loving God is not just about you know, you and I loving God. Love is also a verb. It also means, you know, loving people as we love ourselves. And this is the great commandment. And the way Jesus wants us to do this is to make sure that we shine our light, that we are witnesses, you know, uh, for the kingdom of God, that we are the light in the world, um, you know, that we go out there, win souls, and make disciples. So that's what loving God means. Jesus therefore gave us the great commandment and the great commission. The great commission tells us how to love people. Are you still with me? <laughs> so last week we talked about loving God and we've mentioned a few characteristics. And I want to continue along the same line this morning. And I want to talk to you about specifically intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. What is intimacy with God? What's that all about? 
And just for those who weren't here last week, let's just start with a worship definition. And therefore, I want us to look at the meaning of being intimate with God. In John chapter 4, verse 22 to 25, we read, It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. You remember the Samaritan woman came to Jesus and she asked him, Jesus, uh, because Jesus offered her living water. And then when she discovered, uh, and Jesus also, you know, revealed things in her life. For instance, he revealed to her that she was married to five men and the one she was currently with wasn't her husband. And, uh, and, and she, when she realized he was a man of God, she changed the topic and she started to talk about worship. And she said, you know, our ancestors said we must worship on this mountain, but you Jewish people say that we must worship in Jerusalem. And then Jesus said to her, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to offend you, <laughs> but you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I talk about when it comes to the topic of worship because salvation comes from the Jews. And then Jesus said to her, this is what worship is. It's who you are. And this who you are, we've learned that it's who you become in Jesus, who you've become in him, and the way you live now that you've become in Jesus that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. So here in one sentence, Jesus actually defines worship. It needs more explanation, but in one sentence he says, your worship must do what? In engage your spirit and be in the pursuit of truth. So it comes from all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and from there you live your life. From there, everything who you have become, everything you are, and the way you live, that's what now count before God. And then he continued to say, see, so that's the kind of people the Father is looking for. Why is the Father looking for people like that? Because that is his purpose for your life, to love God. And as you love God and have intimacy with God, from there we love people. Can somebody say amen? So he then continued to say, uh, those who are simply and honestly themselves before him uh, in their worship. God is sheer being itself. God is spirit. And those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirit. So how do we worship God? In spirit and in truth. Uh, their true selves in adoration. And then the woman said, and I love this, she answered Jesus because she had to say something. <laughs> and she's like me, you know, I, I usually, when I don't know what to say, I usually say something stupid. And she said, I, I don't know about that. So <laughs> another translation says she, was con she, she told Jesus, I'm confused now. <laughs> I, here's the thing, I believe many Christians even today are confused about the meaning of true worship. I think we don't understand the meaning. And the purpose of the sermon series is that we will arrive at understanding the meaning of what worship is all about and then live a lifestyle of worship because God is either God of all or not God at all. God is either God of all or not God at all. You cannot decide to give your heart and life to Jesus on a Sunday morning, but Monday you do as ever you know, you, you do whatever you like, whatever seems good to you. You do not involve God in your decisions. You don't involve God in your planning. You, don't God in, you do not involve God in the raising of your children. Uh, um, and then Sunday, you catch up with God again because it's that you are now in the Sunday department, compartment. No, that's not worship. That is not worship. That is religion. God wants to be God of all or not God at all. You cannot say, well, God, you know, I'm going to worship you if you're a young person uh, and then decide to date this boy or this girl, but you haven't consulted God. Then you're not worshiping him. <laughs> I had one amen. The rest of you guys are dating the wrong people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm not talking to married people now. All right. Don't, don't think, oh, my goodness, I've married the wrong person. No. That's the devil speaking to you. Amen. <laughs> All right, so let's look at a definition of worship. Um, true Christian worship is a lifestyle of intimacy with God. Intimacy means that you always hear the heartbeat of God. You always involve Him in everything. You always acknowledge Him. You always welcome Him. That's intimacy with God. True Christian worship is a lifestyle of intimacy with God. 
leading to obedience to His will. Do not say that you worship God, but you don't obey God. You don't do the will of God because Jesus said that true worship is engaging the Spirit and then being in pursuit of truth. If you're in pursuit of truth, it means that you do the will of God. Jesus once said to a, a, a Pharisee uh, and, and, and some of the religious mob of the day, He said, so why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I tell you to do? <laughs> Ask the person next to you, are you one of those? <laughs> Lord, Lord, oh hallelujah on a Sunday. Lord, Lord, hallelujah on a Monday morning when you do a little bit of devotion and then you go out and you do whatever you think is good. You stop to involve the Holy Spirit. You're no longer in pursuit of truth. I know we don't have any people in our church like that, but in other churches there are Christians like that. They are confused like that Samaritan woman is, I don't know what you're talking about. God wants to lead you. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you. He wants to fill you. He wants to teach you what to say, what to do, where to go. He wants to tell you left or right. He wants to say to you yes or no. He wants to tell you to wait. He wants to give you divine instruction and strategy. Hallelujah. That is a life in pursuit of truth. And that is a life that worships God. Can somebody shout amen? And let me tell you something. It will go a lot better with some of us if we start to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Jy is in die moeilikheid vanmorgen, want jy volg nie die stem van die Heilige Geest nie. You are in trouble and you go through stuff that God never intended for you to go through because you're not following, you're not following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You worship Him on a Sunday, but you don't worship Him when you need to make decisions. You see, that's not, that's not a lifestyle of worship. A lifestyle of worship, my friend, includes God is either God of all or not God at all. You cannot decide on every Sunday, you know, to include God when you worship. But then when you continue to live your life, you know, you leave God outside of your decision making of what you're going to do, what you're going to say, what you're going to do with your money. So you bought that car, but it was never God's will. You bought the dress, those shoes, but you've never asked him, you know, what does he think? Whew, you say, wow, this is, this is getting really practical. Should I ask God what to wear? Well, I do that all the time. Because you see, it's difficult to exclude God in certain areas of my life. You know, and now when I really need him, now I want to say, okay, help me. It's, it's, it's including God in the small things. Building our relationship there, walking with him there, that helps us to worship him even when it comes to bigger things with our lives, bigger decisions, bigger choices. Involve him in every area, every aspect, every department. Every compartment, everything, everything of your life, hallelujah. If he's not God at, of all, he's not God at all. So, obedience to his will, loving others, as the Holy Spirit guides us. People, I think, and maybe this definition will change a little bit as we continue uh, to, to, to talk about worship. Next week, I would like to give you, uh, um, to break it down and show you some characteristics. Why am I so persistent that we understand this? Because loving God can only take place through a lifestyle of worship. It can, you cannot love God if you don't understand worship. And um, you, you will never understand worship if you do not understand intimacy with God. And I think that's why the Samaritan was confused. She thought of worship as a place. She never thought it was a place in God. She never thought it was closeness, oneness, intimacy with God. She said, Lord, what are you talking about? I don't know about that. So this is the definition. And then worship is the foundation um, of our purpose and life cre created by God for God. What do you say we read this together here this morning? Are you ready? One, two, three. Let's read. True Christian worship is a lifestyle of intimacy with God, leading to obedience to His will, loving others as the Holy Spirit guides us. Worship is the foundation of our purpose in life, created by God. For oh God, come on. If you believe that, shout amen. Give Him a big praise in this house. I challenge you, go, go read the passage in John 4 again. Look at the definition in the week. When you pray, you say, well, Lord, help me to be a true worshiper. I want to love you. 
I want to know you. I want to grow in you. Lord, if you don't want it, then I don't want it. If you say it's no, then it's no. If you say it's right, then I go right. If you say left, then I go left. Lord, I, I want to get closer to you. Uh, Lord, I want to be intimate and one with you. I want to pursue your will, your truth. I want to obey you. If it's not in your will, I don't want it. How many of you are tired of all the nonsense that go on in your life? <laughs> just need Jesus. Amen. More of Jesus. <laughs> I, I will not say what a speaker at the conference said yesterday. <laughs> um, because I just realized, I wanted to say it, but I realized, you know, you don't, if you don't understand the context, you may take offense. So let's not get there. But let's get back to true worship and loving God. Amen. Loving God is a lifestyle of worship. And it begins with intimacy. Let me tell you something. You will never understand why you must love people. You will never obey God. You will never understand when the Holy Spirit leads you to do something if you are not first a relationship with God. Everything that you and I do and who we are and who we've become in Him, it all, it's, it's all facilitated through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, you know, this is a time where I want to encourage you, grow in intimacy with Jesus. Grow in your relationship with God. Get closer to Jesus. Get closer to His presence. Like Mary who sat at His feet. Make a decision today, I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus. And I want to show you a person who had a particular uh, understanding of intimacy with God. And that was the Apostle John. The Apostle John. <laughs> he understand intimacy with God. And listen, if you look at the writings of the Apostle John, you will see that many of his writings were focused on worship. For instance, John always referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Have you noted that? Uh, I want to ask you, do you think Jesus did not love the other disciples? No. But John understood something I believe about intimacy that none of the other disciples understood. Because he was also a disciple, the disciple who was leaning at the chest of Jesus. And that is what this morning is all about. God's calling you back. He says, I want you to lean at my chest again. I want you to sit at my feet again. I want you to get closer to me. I want intimacy with you, my child. Listen to the scripture um, of John and John 13 verse 23 where the word of God says, One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So who's writing this gospel? John. Now look at John. <laughs> he says, one of his disciples, hey, he's, he's referring to him, I believe he's this in the third person. I don't know. Some of your linguists would, might, might help me write here. But he's not saying, I am John. I'm writing this in the first person. And I am the disciple who Jesus loves. No, he's very under the radar with this. As he said, one of his disciples <laughs> whom Jesus loved, the Amplified Bible says esteemed. So John went on and on about the, the, the love of Jesus for himself. He says, was leaning against the chest of Jesus. So they were sitting at the table. The other disciples realized that John and Jesus had a special relationship. How many of you want a special relationship with Jesus? I'm here to tell you today, special relationship is available to you because Jesus died on the cross for each and every one of us. There's a special relationship available for you and I. With God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a relationship of intimacy available. That's what God is offering us here today. And if we do not understand this and pursue intimacy, church, it will be very difficult to love God in the way God wants us to love Him. I want to say this one more time. If we do not understand intimacy with God, it will be very difficult to love God in the way He's looking for us to love him. That's why Jesus said, when he spoke to the Samaritan woman, he said, you must remember that the f are this kind of worshipers. Church, listen to me. There's a kind of worship the Father is looking for. There's a kind of relationship the Father is looking for, for you and I to have. You see, because He's got great things that needs to be done in this world, great things that needs to be done in your school, your university, your family, uh, amongst your friend circle. And it can only be done if there's intimacy between you and Him. 
Because if there's no intimacy, you will not be in pursuit of His truth and of His will. And that's the basis of true worship, is to worship Him in spirit and truth. Are you with me? Or are you like the Samaritan woman this morning? Say, I, I don't know about that, Pastor. I'm confused. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, ask them, are you confused? <laughs> or are you, still, are you still with us? Come on, are you still with us? So John says the, the one whom Jesus loved, he was leaning against the chest of Jesus. The other disciples asked John, I just want to create context. The other disciples asked John, uh, John, we want you because Jesus said he knew who was going to betray him. So they said to him, John, I, uh, to John, I want, we want you to hear from Jesus. We want you to hear from Jesus. Who will betray him? While they were sitting at the table, Jesus was breaking the bread. And so John was leaning the chest of Jesus. And you know, what I see from this is John was comfortable with close proximity. To, was comfortable to getting close to Jesus. Like, and I see the same thing. In, in the life of Mary, the sister of Martha. You remember we spoke about that a few weeks ago? We sat at the feet of Jesus. My question to you today is, how comfortable are you with the presence of God? And how in pursuit are you this morning? How much of a, pursu a pursuer are you of the presence and intimacy of God? It was, it was easy peasy for John. To lean over, put his, his, and he didn't need to do that. I mean, he, he, he could have just asked him. There's a reason the Bible tells us that John was leaning against the chest of, of Jesus. When was the last time that you leaned against the chest of Jesus, sat at the feet? See, that takes time. That's what God is calling you and I to do here this morning. He's calling you into that kind of relationship. Say with me, relationship. Church, I want you to know God wants a relationship with you. This is not a religious business. This is not a Sunday department business, a compartment business. Now I need to make a decision. Now I consult God. Now I need to, uh, uh, you know, I, need, uh, I have a need in my life. Now I consult God. No, this is not the kind of business we're in. We're in the relationship business with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wants relationship and where there's relationship, there's intimacy, there's closeness. Jesus is calling you back to come and lean on his chest. But you see, only you can make that choice today if you're going to do that. So um, we find the same thing about John. Now, there are many stories. John knew something about intimacy. Let me just mention this. So John also records a story that you don't, don't find in other Gospels, at, at which the core of the story is also... Uh, Intimacy, worship. You remember uh, when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Would you agree we are now back at worship? Peter, do you, do you really love me? Will you worship me? And, and he asked him three times. John records this, like John records the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, where Jesus spoke and defines worship. John speaks about his closeness with Jesus. I'm telling you, listen, John was the David of the New Testament. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I present to you John, the, the King David of the New Testament. Because David was the personification of worship in the Old Covenant. There are things in the Gospel of John that shows me he had a revelation of worship. And when God spoke, the other disciples did not record it, or the other authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they did not record those things. But John's ear was attentive to those worship parts. And I want to ask you here this morning, how, how attentive are you to worshiping God, to loving God, to getting close to Jesus? This is what this message is all about. It's calling us to a life of intimacy with Jesus. God is calling you. He's calling me. I know you're busy. I know you've got a schedule. I know, you know, it's a rat race. There's a hustle. There's a bustle going on in life. Come on, church. But listen, God speaks to you. He says, I want you back to my feet. I want to be intimate with you. He's calling you out of the hustle and the bustle. He's calling you out of all the busyness and all the things we're running after. And he says, come back to my feet that you may hear my heartbeat like John was leaning at the chest of Jesus. Hear my heartbeat because I've got something special in store for you and I want you to do my will and be in pursuit of the truth of my will for your life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 
Are you still with me? Give Jesus a big praise. That was a good place to stand to your feet and honor Him, worship Him. Don't worry, we'll get to that. You know, I was, I'm, I'm so amazed when I look at the conference yesterday. I, I, I see pastors preach when they preach the word. There are people so excited. They stand to their feet and they, uh, and they honor Him. I, I, I pray, Lord, help us to have that culture. And, and please understand, you're not honoring a man. I, I mean, I will love it when you stand and praise Jesus. Uh, and, but I can promise you, I will also understand it's not for me. It's because you, the word excites you. So feel free to do that. You won't give me a big head. I'm long beyond that. Okay, so I will not a big kop as you say clap. But make the name of the Lord great every now and then. Can I a great amen? Cry? <laughs> okay. And what I also saw yesterday was that people don't mind to preach in Sutu, English, and Afrikaans. Some of them, so, so it's like we all accept it, amen. So we're beyond that, amen. And if you don't understand, I, I will be here. You can come and ask me. Pastor, you spoke a little bit Afrikaans there. What did that mean? I will, I will interpret. <laughs> okay. My, um, my youngest child, uh, Ava, she's got this app now. And uh, she's downloaded this app, and I have to start paying for this app, where she learns, I think it's, it's Zulu or Sutu, yeah. and she comes to me, and she says, I, I want to speak this language, and I encourage her. So for those of you who want to learn another language, there are apps out there, okay, and, and that's awesome. So I encourage her, say, please, maybe you'll become a preacher, and uh, you will become an interpreter. I don't know. Maybe she will preach in Zulu or Sutu one of these days. <laughs> I'm prophesying. Amen. So, so let's get over ourselves. That's the point. And worship God and be glad and grateful for his word. God's calling you to intimacy. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Why did Jesus ask him three times? Because Peter denied him three times. And I, listen, I believed Jesus knew that Peter was doubting himself. Do I really love Jesus? You know, as I was doing some preparation, the Lord said, I must tell you, there are people here today, you felt like you've denied Jesus because you've sinned, you've done things, you know, that you're really not proud of. There are some skeletons in your closet that you, you don't even want to talk to you, uh, talk, uh, talk to anybody about. But God wants you to know, doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. He loves you and he wants you to know that the reason you are here and are listening is because you still love him. Woo! That's powerful. You see, it's moments like this where you can stand up and shout, hallelujah. I saw it at the conference yesterday. I don't know what's wrong in our church. We're going to change a few things. And next year, please come to conference with us. Can I get a big amen? <laughs> um, just speak to a few people who were there. Uh, and please, guys, make these other guys that couldn't come, make them jealous. I know there's reasons you couldn't come, but we just want to make you a little bit jealous. Is that okay? <laughs> We're not nasty. We just want to. Will it not be getting frafe? Okay. <laughs> All right. So he denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked him three times. Jesus wanted Peter to know, Peter, you actually do love me, even though you've denied me. And also... Jesus said to Peter, Peter, now if you love me, do what? Love others. Take care of the sheep. And here's the point, and we have to talk about this. Loving God is all also about loving people. This morning, I first, I just want to start with intimacy. So John was the disciple who leaned against the chest of Jesus. But you will see that in many of his writings, he spoke about worship and intimacy with God. Church, God is calling us to a place of intimacy. He's calling you here this morning. He's calling you to intimacy. Listen to me, please. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You've come to church. You wanted to hear the Word of God. Here's the Word of God. He calls you out of this rat race, out of the hustle, out of the bustle, out of the complexities, out of the negativities, out of the disruptions and disturbances of this world. He says, come, 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 come closer to me again. Is God calling you to come closer here this morning? Because He's calling me. It is so easy to fall prey to the busyness, to the hustle, to the bustle of life, to our challenges. And again, I don't make light of what you're going through, but nothing's going to change unless you come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. It's time to lean 
with your head at the chest of Jesus. This is where you're going to hear his heartbeat. Now listen, I just want to mention this. I've, I've researched this, and, and there are many more, but I want to show you five benefits that John experienced because of his intimacy with Jesus that the other disciples did not experience. And therefore, rightfully, I believe this is the reason why I continued you know, to refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. I'm the disciple Jesus loves. Go like this, say, I'm the disciple Jesus loves. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and go like this, he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Hallelujah. Look at this. Look what will happen if you pursue intimacy. Can I share you just a few things? If you will pursue, in, listen, if you will become a pursuer of intimacy, God, His presence. Look at John. Look what happened to John. The first thing is he died a natural death uh, of old age. Why am I saying this? Because I believe all the other disciples were tortured. Okay, John was also tortured. He was boiled, you know, on the island of Patmos. But here's the thing. He died a natural death. God delivered him from, from being, uh, execute, being executed. Like Matthew was stoned. James was, uh, 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 rather, Matthew, I believe, was stabbed to death. Uh, James was uh, stoned and clapped to death. Uh, we know Peter was crucified upside down. Some of the other disciples were crucified. Uh, they all, they were all executed for their faith. John, and I firmly believe this because of his intimacy with Christ, God gave him a, 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 a long and satisfying life. He went through trials and tribulations. Don't misunderstand me. But in the end, he lived and he died of natural causes, old age. I see the Psalm 91, the 16 promise on, on, on John's life. I don't see it on the other disciples. They all died. Um, another, another privilege or benefit that I see in the life of John is that John was asked by Jesus to take care of his mother. And you remember when Jesus was, you know, was hanging on the cross, Jesus looked at John and his mother Mary, and he said to Mary, there's your son John. And he looked at John and he says, there's your mother. And the Bible says, from that day, John took care of him. What am I saying? If you will pursue intimacy with God, God will trust you with some special assignments in this world. I don't know about you, but that catches my attention. Paul said the same thing to Timothy. He said to Timothy, Timothy, listen to me. Seek God. Pursue God. Worship Him. He says, keep your life pure. He says, because in a wealthy household, there are utensils of gold and silver. I'm not, I don't know if I pr pronounce that correctly. He says, but there are also ordinary utensils. He says, but if you will pursue God, you will keep your life pure. God will use you for special occasions, just like utensils of gold and silver are used for special occasions. I want to pray over this crowd here this morning that God will give you a desire to be uniquely and specially used by Him. I want to pray that God will put mantles on this crowd, uh, that we will see multitudes and thousands coming in through the people in this room and who are listening. I declare a mantle coming upon your life, a calling, an anointing, a power of God coming on your life that shakes everything up around you in Jesus' name. I declare and prophesy over you, you shall be no ordinary utensil. You shall be an ordinary a utensil of gold and silver. God has a unique purpose, a unique call, a unique anointing I release over your life here this morning. If you take it, shout amen and give him a big praise in Jesus' name. But it starts with intimacy. It starts with closeness. It starts with oneness. It starts by coming back to Jesus and seeking him and make time for God like you've never done before. I don't know about you, but things like that excites me. There's things that God has placed in my heart. There are two things which I'll share in the right time. Which when I've done them, I will come and say, God is using me. God is using me as a, as a special utensil. A special call. And it's going to shake our city. And it's going to transform nations. Because the Lord promised me we will be a light, a light to the nations. I don't know how it's going to do it, but it's happening. I want you all to be part of that. And God, and therefore, you have to be uniquely anointed. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Uh, in Jesus' name. Come on, church. God's not finished with the church. The good work that he started in this church, he will complete. In <laughs> not, not the good work he started in me. The good work he started here. Amen. 
in this church because it's not about me. It's about God and fulfilling His purpose. Yes, obviously God's going to complete this good work that He started in you as well. Amen. So, uh, you see, okay, let's quickly, time's up. John was highly esteemed by Jesus. He was in the inner circle. He was counted. He was esteemed. Matthew 17, verse 8, we see James, John, and Peter. Always James, John, and Peter. Armand, James, John, and Peter. Armand, James, John, and Peter. <laughs> Leon, James, John, and Peter. Leon, James, John, and Peter. How many of you want to be in the inner circle of Jesus? Hallelujah. Come on, Rodney, James, John, and Peter. Rodney, James, John, and Peter. <laughs> Come on, say yes, Lord, count me in. Count me in. <laughs> count me in. I mean, I'm going to be in your inner circle. Hallelujah. Why? Because there's going to be intimacy between you and Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the inner circle of Jesus. I want to hear the heartbeat. I want to lean against his chest and hear what he says and hear what he wants and obey him and say, Lord, you can have everything. You can have it all, Lord. Here I am. Take me take me take me it all starts with intimacy without intimacy we cannot experience any of these things sadly there's so many christians in the world nowadays that they've become cold and religious and dead and even though they're good people they don't know what intimacy is all about but there are some special things assigned to us who knows intimacy john wrote the book of revelation he he wrote first second and third epistle of john he wrote he wrote the Gospel of John. So he, he wrote the first, third most books, Paul first, then Luke, then John. But here's the thing. God entrusted him with revelation. Say with me, revelation. The book of Revelation was written by John when God had taken him in, in to, to see visions while he was being tortured, actually, on the island, island of Patmos. You see, when you go through tough times, uh, God allows certain tough times and seasons in your life to reveal certain things to you. Did you all get that? <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you haven't been through hell and back, David said, uh, Lord, you know, that uh, as I go through the valley of the shadow of death, if you haven't been through the valley of the shadow of death, there's certain things you will never know unless you've been through the valley of the shadow of death where God shows you stuff, reveals stuff to you, opens stuff to you. All of a sudden, you understand the Word of God. All of a sudden, there's revelation in your heart. And I pray that revelation will come to you in Jesus' name. But it starts with intimacy with God. How prepared are you to be intimate with Jesus? To make sure that you're in his inner circle. To lean with your head against his chest so you can hear his heartbeat. The finest whisper of the spirit because there are some special things in store for you and I who love God in this way. So he wrote this book, the prophetic apocalyptic material. God gave him to write it. Special things are preserved and hold for those who pursue intimacy. Say with me, I'm a pursuer of intimacy. God's calling you back to pursue intimacy. And then he was favored by Jesus. <laughs> Everybody could see it. And, uh, you know, I, I studied many passages, but let me sum it up like this. After Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you? Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. I love you. Jesus had this whole conversation with Peter. He said, okay, Peter, come now and follow me. And then as Peter was getting up to follow Jesus, I, I'm not sure where they were going, um, but then Peter looked at John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He asked Jesus, he said, but what about him? Now look at this. Peter knows there's favor on John's life. Peter knows there's a special connection between Jesus and John. This is why when Jesus wanted to say something or take P Peter somewhere, John asked, but what about Oh, Peter asked, but what about John? Then Jesus said, don't worry about John now. We need to do some business, you and I. I'll get back to John. I love John. But what I want you to know is that, and see here, is that John was favored. And all the disciples knew. If that wasn't the truth, Peter would not have asked Jesus, what about John? Are you with me? Why is this? Why was John favored? Pursuing intimacy. Are you too busy? Are you too busy? Are you too caught up in the hustle and bustle of life? Listen, is God Lord of all in your life? Do you acknowledge Him 
every area department? Do you welcome him? Do you involve him? Do you seek him? Do you lean with your head against the table? David, we can say the same thing about David, but I think we must just conclude here this morning. Um, I, I might just say that David, if you look at the life of King David, you will see all these aspects and benefits in his life. Maybe let me mention one thing about David. Let's go to that scripture, and then we will conclude. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so chuffed with this message, but I realize, you know, <laughs> time's up. I understand. But listen to this. Let's, let's do, let's do, Lord, help me. I want to do everything. <laughs> First Samuel 13, 14 says, but now your kingdom must end. Um, God was talking about Saul. He says, for the Lord has sought out a man after his Listen, people, intimacy with God is all about being a man and a woman after God's own heart. I, I want us to pray that here this morning. Lord, help me to be a man after your heart. Help me to be a woman after your heart. I'm telling you, nothing will ever be the same again if that becomes your desire. Nothing will ever be the same again. You see, the problem with Saul is he, instead of worshiping God and pursuing intimacy with God, he was pursuing his own kingdom and he's doing his own things and he got caught up in his own title. And so, and so the word of God says, so the Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people. Because why? You have not kept Saul. Why? What did you do wrong? You haven't kept the... And you see singular command. What is the greatest command? Loving God, loving people. Saul, you no longer, longer love God, and you've stopped to love the people of Israel. You are, your kingship is now all about you. And we know that Saul was not obedient to God. Look, look at Acts chapter 13, 22. But God removed Saul, the man who was no longer loving God and loving the people of Israel, and he replaced him with David, a man whom, about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my, man after my own heart. People, please make that your desire here. Please, can we pray about that? Lord, I want to be a woman after your heart. Listen to me. I, whatever you need, whatever you, whatever breakthrough you need, whatever direction, whatever complexity exists in your life and you need solutions. Everything starts with intimacy. God, get back to Jesus. Religion is not a quick fix, uh, or rather religion seems like a quick fix, but having a relationship with God is not a quick fix thing. You need to pursue His presence, His glory. You need to pursue intimacy. From intimacy, God will begin to direct us from that place of intimacy. Church, listen, everything God has in store for you, His whole will, His whole purpose, everything, everything you're seeking from God here this morning, everything starts with intimacy and being in pursuit of being a woman or a man after God's own heart. So just listen to this because there's something, a point I want to make here. He says, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Now look at what, what God is saying he says, he will do everything I want him to do. <laughs> yes, we have to talk a little more about this, but not today. Because if I get into this, I know I'm, I'm losing you. Let's stop it here. <laughs> Let's stop it here. Are you prepared to do everything God tells you to do? Don't just say yes, because... I can testify in times of my own life where I knew I had to do something and I didn't do them because they were too big. They, were too, they, they required too much faith. They, they were too uncomfortable. So if I ask the question, will you do everything that God wants you to do? I think we say yes, we want to. But it's not so easy. Why is it not easy? Because we're not intimate with God. If there's true intimacy, we will really be able to do whatever God tells us. And this is why. And, and you know, we, we need to develop this theme of loving God through a lifestyle of worship. I think by now you realize it's not so simple as we thought. Are you with me? Okay, so can I summarize it? We have our definition. Next week we're going to get into that. And we're gonna, we are going to put this, unpack this thing so that you can love God. But here's something I want to leave you with. Worship 
true worship can be summarized in one word, obedience. Radical obedience is the highest form of worship. Radical obedience is the highest form of worship. Why don't we obey? If there's intimacy, we will obey. Many children of God do their own thing, make their own decisions, live their own lives. <laughs> they, they just wing it. How many of you how many of you've ever winged something? You just, you just wing it. My gut feeling, unless you, when you say gut feeling, you mean the Holy Spirit leads you, but if gut feeling is just your fleshly intuition, then I don't want to hear about it. Listen to me, we do not obey because there's no, we, we're not leaning against the chest. Of God. He's calling you back. You're going to be a radical obeyer because that's what God's looking for in this hour. If he says something, you do it. If He says something, you do it. If He says something, you do it. Yes, yes, rhythm. Boom, 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 boom. That's what God's looking for. That's pursuing truth. Who worship is? Engaging the spirit and pursuing truth. Worship in spirit and in the pursuing truth is boom, boom, obey, 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 obey. S say this to this person, yes. Give this amount to that person, yes. Pray for this person, yes. Lead this per invite this person to church, yes. Obey, obey. Say this to your husband, make him a nice meal this afternoon, yes. I love it because when I've got anointing, yeah, I can say anything. Hallelujah. And everybody, I was saying, make him a nice meal. Every, even, the, even the woman goes like, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I got you. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you with me? Hallelujah. Stop there. Let's stand to our feet. Pray a simple prayer, but make sure it comes from your heart. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. But today, I pray, help me to get closer to you, to, be a, to become a pursuer of intimacy. Sorry, Lord. Sorry that you haven't been Lord of all. I make my own decisions. I live my own life. I don't do your will. I don't, do, I don't obey. I have to part... You are God of a department of my life, but you are not God of every department. Maybe there's a department you want to surrender to God, a decision you want to surrender to God. Maybe there's something you want to bring to God. Say, I never involved you in this. I never welcomed you here. I never asked you here. Oh, God, I've never acknowledged you here. And maybe some of you are in trouble because of that. And, and, and you know, this is your moment. And God says, I'll forgive you and, and just come back to me. And then some of us, we, you know that you're too busy and you've got so many excuses why you cannot be intimate with Jesus. And you need to repent and I need to repent of that and say, Lord, whew, sorry, I've missed it. I haven't been leaning against your chest for a very long time. I haven't been at your feet for a very long time. I do this religion thing, Sunday, little devotion, got the book, got the booklet, the Bible thing, kind of just hoping for the best, but I, I ha I'm not a pursuer of intimacy. I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry for taking you for granted, Lord. Father, I know you're looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth, but my spirit, my heart, not been engaging for quite some time. Let's pray. Let's humble ourselves. Let's get back to Jesus. Seek Him. Let's surrender every part, aspect, department of our lives. Let's do it here this morning. Father, I pray for your people. I thank you that you touch every heart, stir every life. Anoint your people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anoint them, anoint them, Lord. I pray that, uh, that as the Holy Spirit fall upon them, pour out your Spirit, let a hunger and a thirst come. And I speak fire in every heart again. A yearning for God, a thirst, a hunger. John and James, Lord, they were called sons of thunder. 
I pray for some women and men of thunder in this place. Zeal, passion, fire. That's why they were in the inner circle of Jesus. If you want to be in the inner circle of Jesus, you must become a woman, a man of thunder. I pray for men and women of thunder. Zeal for Christ. Pursuers of intimacy. It all starts there. The reason we don't obey is because we never intimate. Therefore, we live a version of your will, Lord. A by the way version. We repent of that. We're sorry. We want to be accurate. We want everything you want. I pray it over your people. Just pray this prayer after me. Say, Father God, this morning, I worship you. I honor you. And I repent if I've drifted from you. If I don't have time for you. Sorry, Lord, for not pursuing you the way I'm supposed to. I surrender every part of my life to you. Every area, every department, every aspect. I welcome you. I involve you. Lead me. Help me to worship in spirit and truth. Amen. Give him a big praise. Hallelujah.